there is a there there is a joy in obedience. There's a joy in proclaiming the glory of God. Um, when I share the gospel and I proclaim the excellencies of Christ and the sufficiency of His work and the uh, expiration of the need for the old covenant temple sacrificial system, how Jesus is the ultimate mic drop. Long ago, in many ways, God has spoken to our forefathers, to the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken through the Son. Mic drop. Something definitive about the coming of Jesus that in the book of Hebrews talks about how um, He just He's better. He's better than Moses. He's better than He's better than Aaron. He's better than Melchizedek. Jesus is immensely. Um, he. It's, it's enjoyable to proclaim his excellencies and it's obedience to do what he required. He's our king. He's the cosmic prime minister. He's the, he's the ultimate boss. He gets to tell me what to do. If I never saw any visible fruit in this life from that, uh, that would be, that would, that, there would be legitimate godly tears and I would pray, Lord, please encourage me with more fruit. Encourage me with um, people who have come to know the Lord. Um, please send me encouragement, you know, through that. <clears throat> but it's, it's worth it to be faithful. We've got precedent in Scripture with Jeremiah, for example, the weeping, the weeping prophet. Um, where God sends him to teach a, a message, a legitimate offer, a legitimate proclamation, an invitation, um, a pleading. And yet it's also, God knows it'll certainly lead to the further hardening of the people and a blindness of the people. And God, we just have to trust that God is good and he has his reasons. He gets to define his own goodness. He gets to be known as he reveals himself. Um, he gets to... Um, we get to say God is good and he gets to define his goodness. And we, he has bigger plans that I, I, I can understand. And he's given me clues. He, he's talked about how, for example, uh, the hardening of the hearts of the Jews in, in Mass, in Romans 11, opened the floodgates of the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. When? And how that will eventually result in a way we quite can't quite understand in a jealousy on a part on the part of the, the Jews which will lead to further salvation of the Jews so if I'm in a part in a, in a part of history where my preaching is resulting in the hardening of hearts through faithful gospel preaching then I can trust God's multi-generational plans of goodness to redeem people from every tribe and tongue and nation and to render right judgments such that we celebrate his, both his justice and his mercy at final judgment. He's good. Also, we get the, the joy of working with other believers. We get to be honed on the gospel and enjoy his word, um, make friends with other believers. So yeah, yeah, even if there's no visible near season fruit, it's worth doing. But... Typically, you're going to have downstream fruit that brings tears to your eyes. Um, I think about right now even fruit that's indirect from a ministry, uh, fruit that has been salvation through the galvanizing of evangelists, which has indirectly resulted in the salvation of other people. Um, I think about being a part of the discipleship of new believers. I think about the friends we've made. Um, I think, and, I, and I also I think about a lot of the emails I've received over the years of people thanking me for the conversations we've had when they were unbelievers, for the videos that have been posted. It's born fruit. An evangelist, if he's worth his salt, over time, will learn to love the local church. And it won't make sense to do long-term evangelism without pointing people to local churches. So a practical thing you can do is get to know the local churches in the area that you're evangelizing. 
make a list, make a, make a spreadsheet and get to know what's available because you want to point people, you want to invite people to a local church. Uh, you want to be able to do follow-up at the, uh, at the end of a conversation, for example. You want to be able to give them options and, and, and galvanize and say, hey, please, um, or join me for church this Sunday. Here's where I go. Or here's some options near you. There are pastors there that would be eager to have coffee with you. They'd jump on the opportunity to have lunch with you. They would be gentle with you. I know this is new to you. There's people there that would love you and bring you in and uh, invite you into fellowship and explain everything needed. Um, have you become a part of their small groups and friendship groups and Bible study groups and love to have you on Sunday morning. We'd love for you to hear the word and we'd love for you to just see what a church service is like. So get to know the, the, the reasonably faithful churches in your, in your valley and make a list and be prepared to invite them to a local church. And equally important, um, see your ministry as an asset to the local churches. That's your aim. You're not there to be a an annoyance to the local churches. You're not there to be unnecessarily contradicting the, you know, sound wisdom of the local churches there. You're, you're there to uh, assist the growth of the kingdom of God, which is chiefly represented in the existence of local churches. So um, you're there to feed people into the kingdom of God, hopefully into the local churches. So um, see your ministry is connected to that. And if you're, if you're super cynical, there's no good churches anywhere. You, know, and you probably shouldn't be on the street doing evangelism. If, uh, if you're neglectful of the local church, that's your first order of business to take care of. Don't, don't stress about whether or not your church officially blesses from the pulpit and schedules and announces what you're doing. Don't just let that slide. Don't make a big deal out of that. Don't, don't be offended by that not being the case. Do receive the blessing of your elders, at least informally, that they know what you're doing. You're willing to submit anything needed to their authority under their counsel, under their wisdom, under their direction, under the cor correction. So you do want to have a good relation working relationship with your local church. But if you're a regular presence and you're working with stable people from different local churches, um, that gives your pastors the ability to tell others in your church, some new guy comes and he's got a, an itch for evan and he's got an itch he's got a scratch. He wants to do evangelism. He can point, your pastor can point them to you because you have a regular presence and, and uh, you, you know, but they meet there and then you can carpool with them at 6 p.m. that day of the week. In Ephesians 4, Paul talks about how the apostles and prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists serve the local church. They, they build the church up. They feed the church. They prepare saints for the ministry of building up the church. If you are a gifted or called evangelist, or perhaps if you're just a normal Christian who's doing evangelism, God means for your evangelism in the long run to bless your local church. And I think one of the ways God does that is through reports, where you are debriefing perhaps in, through pictures and the written word. You're recounting how things went. And you're, you're explaining to people the kinds of conversations you were able to have and the, the gospel material you, you were able to communicate. And you're talking about the dramatic stories and the amazing things God has done. And this is the book of Acts, like the God stories, what God accomplished, all the amazing things that God did. You can't spend years doing evangelism and not have amazing stories that God has given you. Or, you know, even just regular, normal stories of sharing the gospel. There's something about that and then sharing the stories that blesses believers. Not everybody in your church needs to be actively engaged in stranger evangelism the same way you are. 
This isn't about necessarily winning them all over to showing up on the same night as you to do the same things you do. Your church is blessed with having some strong evangelists among them. It has a downstream spiritual encouraging effect on the body. It's really cool. It's really cool. It emboldens your brothers. It encourages your sisters. Um, It keeps the gospel at the forefront. It helps you stay focused and return to focus on the gospel. There, There are battles worth fighting all over the place with respect to doctrine and culture and ethics, but it helps you crystallize again on the gospel. And so it helps you live in community better with people who have very different positions than you on certain points of theology. And yet you can live in community together, doing evangelism together with people on the spectrum of, you know, Protestant Christianity. It's been amazing. These are faithful, genuine brothers who love the glory of God and they love the gospel. We have some pretty significantly different positions on issues, but we love the gospel together. And that kind of unified focus is a blessing on the local church. It also has a downstream effect on a love for doctrine. You can't get a dozen guys together to do evangelism without eventually talking theology, (laughs) where you're going through the Bible, you're asking questions, you're um, telling people about your recent doctrinal discoveries, the books you've been reading, what's blessed you, the sermons your pastors are preaching. You can't not get more interested in theology and do evangelism in a context like that. So that has a downstream effect on encouraging the body that you are in to appreciate theology more. It also requires a backbone. Over time, you realize you've got to stiffen up your, your, your spine. You've got to straighten up your spine. Um, evangelism is at times um, costly to your reputation. Um, it's costly to, um, you know, you, it su- subjects you to being canceled by certain elements of society. Um, God calls you to tell the truth. And when you have people you're doing evangelism to bring up, you know, hot button social topics, you'll use the Bible to address them. And so over time, it, 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 it forces you to muscle up. It forces you to flex, to, to exercise your muscles, um, not to puff your chest out, but to, it forces you to, to exercise your, 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 your boldness and your courage. And so I think what it does too is it matures men into being uh, bold soldiers. And that has a downstream edifying effect on a local body. There might be occasions where you can talk to a crowd. So in our case, this would be a tourist bus unloading 40 people. And they all exit the bus and they plant themselves and they're just kind of getting ready to go inside the the area, maybe the private property or Temple Square. But they're on the sidewalk and I would say you, you've got to move fast. Hand out a tract, if you can, to everyone exiting that bus. Hand, hand out, you know, try to get as much out as you can. And then um, hopefully someone among the brothers can lift their hand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian. We're here to share the gospel. We're here to talk about Jesus. And you've you've got 30 seconds, maybe. And that's where you do need to prepare, I think. You need to have some talking points um, where maybe you're sharing the gospel with them. Maybe you're warning them. In in the case of Temple Square, you're warning them about um, some things that they won't tell you, that they ought to tell you on Temple Square. Mormonism was started by a man named Joseph Smith who taught XYZ, who did ABC. Um, We would love to talk with you about this stuff. So after your tour, please consider coming out and asking us questions. We'd be glad and eager to to speak with you. So that's when you really got to learn how to speak um, cogently and quickly to the crowd 
Um, that's with a tourist group. You might have just a, you know, a group of a dozen Pokemon Go players that are crossing the street. And maybe they're goofballs. Maybe they're you know, teenagers, and they're just having a fun time. And so you can smile, and you could, you could just be straightforward. My name's Aaron. I'm a Christian. I would love to tell you about Jesus. You could say, John, you could just start with a Bible verse, John 3.16, or summarize the gospel in a different way, and then invite them to talk to you. Um, so you can use crowds to share the gospel. And what, what's neat about crowds is uh, you'll say something concise, and what it often does is it piques someone's interest. So the rest of the crowd leaves and one or two people stay behind. Or in the case of Temple Square, you'll have a bunch of tourists who listen, they go in, and then they come back out and they say, I've been thinking about what you said, and they want to talk more. Or the crowd sticks around and they're just, what is going on? And they, and they, and they talk with you. In that occasion, um, that's where a straight preacher is born. <laughs> That's, where, that's what happened to me on um, the streets of Manti is I would just talk with these groups of young adults and teenagers and the crowds would just start forming. And so I started having to lift my voice and I started to learn how to do crowd management where you, where you um, work with the crowd. Somebody might yell something out in the back and you say, well, did you please say it louder for the rest of us so that everybody can hear it? And so you're, you're normalizing the projecting of your voice because when you project your voice, um, it, it's, it, you know, it's easy to look crazy. It's easy to look like you're you know, out of control, but you're just trying to, to make your, your voice heard to people. It's not that you're out of anger or that you're you know, screaming or like that. It's just, you're just trying, and not everyone's voice is made the same for that. One harsh truth is that not everyone vocally is built for that. That's okay. Some brothers are better built for that. Well, you can project your voice. You can share the gospel. Um, my counsel in those situations is to speak slowly because the, the bigger the crowd gets, the less they can hear you enunciate and articulate. So you have to have short sentences or short clauses with words that you can slowly and clearly enunciate. You can't talk fast, big sentences. Uh, and then you need to project you can't be shy about projecting so they can hear you. And it's helpful, I think, to use your hands because your hands are, 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 are complementing the accentuation. Your hands are drawing attention to what you're saying. Your hands are helping uh, emphasize different things. And they're, and they're drawing visual attention from the crowd. When you do that, um, you might get a heckler. And a heckler can be a blessing because you can smile you don't need to be angry back. You can just, sir, and you can respond. You can ask a question. Um, you could slow down and welcome the exchange. If somebody's just heckling to drown you out or insult you, you could just ignore them. Ignore them. We've had huge groups of young adults come by, and I'll just preach sometimes, and uh, maybe one of them is upset that I'm able to make my message heard, and so they'll come over and try to drown me out and just have to ignore it. It's, and they might, they might pretend like they want to have a conversation at that exact moment and stop you from preaching. It's like, hey, I'm glad to talk with you afterwards. I'm going to preach for now. And, and that's where, so one thing that's neat about preaching, and I know this isn't, that when, I, when, I, when I think about regular evangelistic fellowships, it's 98% small group conversations or one-on-ones. It's really the exception, and it's really the the outlier context where straight preaching becomes super helpful and appropriate. In certain contexts, you can bring a stool, you can preach, and let the crowds form, and you can work with your other Christians. So one thing is you're not trying to disrupt the immediate atmosphere wherein other believers are starting to are trying to have small group conversations. So you're trying not to disrupt existing conversations. You're not trying to contradict the ethos, I think, of the collective Christian community that you're working with. There might be certain valid forms of evangelism that you could do that you should choose not to do for the sake of working with other beloved brothers who might have a range of sensitivities over what they think is most strategic and wise and loving so you accommodate that, you work with them. But if you're in a community of, of evangelists where street preaching is acceptable in a certain context, 
preach. And then use the interplay of your brothers um, picking people off the crowd. And if they pick everyone off, that's a win. And you just step down and, and then your preaching has evolved into a bunch of clusters of small group conversations. But if you're going to do that, and I, I know I've met young men over the years who get really excited to try it out, just memorize a list of a half dozen verses. If you're going to project your voice, make the dominant words that you're using be God's words. Don't mock, don't jeer, don't make stupid jokes, don't provoke in fleshly, worldly ways. Um, Try to weave in a bold declaration with a compassionate pleading. So weak preaching doesn't declare And I think harsh or caustic preaching, which I've done before, I've had to correct, be corrected on this. Caustic preaching doesn't weave in a compassionate, perhaps tearful pleading. It's good to marry those two aspects of it together. Sometimes when you're doing regular evangelistic work on the street together, drama happens. And it might be a kind of drama that isn't worth it. So I want you to think about uh, preparing yourself for having a right view of drama. If you've got a car accident a block over, or if you've got a drunk guy you know, 100 feet over being arrested, or if you've got someone on drugs who's acting erratically, <clears throat> or let's say the security guards for the adjacent private property are a little skittish about having evangelists outside. You've been respectful to them, but they're being, you know, sometimes, sometimes they can be combative or acrimonious or rude. And, you know, it, you, know you feel uh, amped up about it. Um, learn to overlook that stuff. Learn to look for the real drama. The real drama is the people who are passing by who need the gospel. The real drama is perhaps a very peaceful conversation you're having with a young adult who's never heard the gospel before. How incredible is that drama when you think about this person's life and how they were made in the womb and perhaps they've never heard the gospel clearly articulated before. When you summarize someone's life and you think about the milestones, the important God-given milestones in that person's life, them hearing the gospel, that is a hundred times more important than any of this other drama you're thinking about. So if you've got a troublemaker there, if you're feeling offended by some you know, mistreatment, um, it, just learn to have a, a correct view of how God sees what's going on. So if you're there long enough doing a regular evangelistic fellowship, you perhaps will get a troublemaker, perhaps even a recurring troublemaker, but whether a one-time gadfly or a recurring troublemaker, you'll want to think about a strategy beforehand about managing such people. Because you might have, say, a half dozen Christians trying to do peaceful small group conversations where you might have somebody who is, uh, sometimes it's people who are on drugs or uh, just erratic, might have mental stability issues, or they're just arrogant and angry. This is pretty rare, but it's worth noting because you do it for years, it happens. So um, it's good to have a willingness among the group to sacrifice yourself for the evening where, where you'll do babysitting. And that, so that might mean, mean you being pulled aside to engage in a de-escalating, peaceful, managing conversation with somebody where you're keeping them busy for the night. And it, it, it might be that they're just beside themselves. Um, maybe God wants you to talk to them for salvific reasons. Maybe God wants you to show the grace of God through, he wants to show that through you to them. Maybe he just wants to be glorified in conflict resolution and de-escalation. And maybe you're just serving your brothers. 
by talking to somebody who's not pleasant for hours. So sometimes we'll have brothers that babysit, that talk to somebody who is a troublemaker, who causes problems. Um, this is rare. I'm just I'm saying this after having done this since, you know, 13, 14 years of evangelism. So we've been really blessed to have brothers that understand what's going on. Um, they're not offended by the situation. Like, I'll, I'll take them. <laughs> you might trade off from week to week. Um, but it's a good way to serve your brothers. God seems to send people to Utah with a continuous flow, trickles in, of people who just had a heart for reaching Mormons, and so they move to Utah. Or they get a job change, and they just move here, and they're Christians, and God trickles in the Christian community here. There's an import of Christianity here, building on the foundation of Christianity here. And there's people who move here that are excited to do ministry, and I, I just want to encourage those people not to wait for a website or a logo or an official organization or a 501c3 or you know an official uh, blessing. Just move out here or stay where you're at. Be a part of a local church and um, start with the low hanging fruit. You don't. You, you can do ministry before you are a ministry before you have a ministry. So you, know, you have low-hanging fruit like opportunities for evangelism. Um, you could read book. This, this is a really good low-hanging fruit uh, for online ministry. Read a book. Read a book and do a book review. Really simple. Like, that's free content. Like, like read a really good book and quote good sections from it, review it, and then make a YouTube video out of your review. And then and start to gather information, and then and maybe join some groups and try to talk to some, you know, common Latter Day Saints, and share the gospel, and make a habit out of that, and find some other people that you can do that in community with. Um, you don't need to be a part of a church where that's like, you know, a thing. That's um, most churches in Utah are just churches in Utah. They just going about the plotting business of preaching the word and discipling their people. Come out here and be a part of that. Be a part of the Christian infrastructure. Get a job. Don't feel like you have to raise support necessarily. It might, might work for you. It might be the right thing for you. But just get a job. Uh, uh, go get a, a trade or a marketable set of transferable skills or a college degree or an internship and build up a career for the provision of a family and move out here and... Grow your career, um, learn to be more professional, um, be respectable in your community, and get busy doing evangelism and schedule it if you need to, and then you know use the gifts that God has given you. Um, Utah, I think, needs more Christians, a lot more. We could use a lot more churches, a lot more. Um, I think one thing that really motivates some people to move to Utah is, I've known Christians that have moved here because they were just using the logic of, okay, where demographically is Christianity least represented? Biblical, evangelical, least represented in America. Like if I just had to look at a heat map of proportion, you know, percentages, where is it pretty hurt and bad? And, and, and people look at Utah and they're like, whoa, it's a low percentage. A really generous percentage might be 6% evangelical. I don't know how people arrive at that number. <laughs> I look at Salt Lake Valley and I'm like, of church-going evangelical Christians at biblical churches, I'm not a statistician. I'm thinking more like at, at worst 1%, 2%, 3% might be more reasonable. Um, but if you want to live in an area where most of your neighbors and coworkers aren't Christians like genuine biblical Christians who know the Lord of the Bible, um, Utah is a great place to go to. And you don't need to be you know, seminary trained or you don't need to be um, especially gifted for it. You just need to have, I think, a vision for raising a family out here. One vision I think that Christians have, should have here in Utah, is that of building Christian infrastructure. It's becoming less and less reasonable for Christians to send their kids to public schools. It's more and more obvious, I think, that we should 
either at home or in Christian schools, have a, have a Christian kingdom infrastructure for the education of our children. And to have that at least you know, connected to some local churches. We don't have much of that here. We need it more. So come out here and build a kingdom and, and uh, don't worry about needing all the right credentials. Just need to find a good local church and be discipled by some older men. <clears throat> There's a lot of Christians out here that have moved here. You don't know their names. And they got a job and they joined a local church and they try to reach the neighbors. And they're just quietly plodding forward to reach the neighbors without any YouTube presence, without any blog, without any logo, without any official ministry. They're just, they're just Christians in Utah. And so when you ask them, why did you move to Utah? They might say, I just moved here to be a Christian in Utah, to be a Christian in Utah. And that, that's helpful. That's, a, that's, oh man, one other thing. We need more, we need older Christians in Utah. So if you've spent decades in the ministry, perhaps, or decades in a, in a faithful local church, and let's say you're 50 or 60 or 70 years old, you could move here and just join a church and then just disciple younger guys from different gen earlier generations. We don't have the people infrastructure here yet. There's no saturation of older, vetted, seasoned Christian grandpas here. Not, not, a, lot of, not a lot of Christian grandmas here. Not a lot of uh, old Christian oak trees. They're there. They're here. You, know, you can find them if you look hard enough. But the average Christian church in Utah desperately could use some 65-year-old, solid oak tree, stable, mature Christian guys that can do coffee with other brothers speak into their lives about fatherhood and being a husband, preach the word, teach the word, support the local pastor, encourage the local church, just be here and die well, suffer maybe <laughs> for, the, for the glory of Jesus and, uh, and then call it, <laughs> go to heaven. We could, that, I, hope, I hope that would, we, we, I hope to see more of that before I die someday. There's a term I read once that stuck with me. It's called supremacy evangelism. We typically think of evangelism as an act of reconciliation. Uh, that's Paul's language. Um, be reconciled to God. We're in a ministry of reconciliation. That's legit. We want people to be right with God. We want people to be forgiven and joined with other believers, loving their enemies, no longer at enmity with God, there's another aspect of evangelism where God is boasting of his own greatness. You see this in Isaiah, where God has a showdown with the other nations, where he makes a case for why he alone is worthy of worship. This is evangelistic. This is touting the unique glory and supremacy of God over all other heavenly beings, if you want to call them gods, or idols, or any, anything, any imaginary deity, anything, anything you can conceive of. God is greater, greater than that. Evangelism is, among other things, a proclamation of the unique supremacies of Jesus Christ and the glory of God. So you can take a lot of pleasure and glory in the greatness of God. And I have taken a lot of joy in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, where God makes a case he says he's never been taught the path of justice. No one's ever held God's hand as a, you know, as a tutor and tutored him through wisdom and justice and righteousness. God has never been taught those things. He knows those things in himself, never received the knowledge from another. He's, it says in Isaiah, he's incomparable. He can't be compared to any other. Who will you, to whom will you compare me? I am the Lord, that is my name. He's not like any other. He stands out. He says in Isaiah 43.10, Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. In Isaiah 44, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Is there another rock? Is there another God? I know not of any other. 
He says in Isaiah, he won't give his glory to another. He says in the book of Job in Romans 11, he's never received a gift as though to repay another. He's never received a Christmas gift and said, thank you, I always wanted that. I never had that. I was deficient and needy and lacking, and you met my need. God has been the most blessed. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And God is the most blessed because he's never ultimately received. He's been the ultimate giver, and therefore he's the most blessed. He gets the greatest joy of giving because everything that's given ultimately comes from God. Paul says to the Corinthians, why do you boast as though what you have you did not receive? God gets to boast that what he has he did not receive. He literally does boast that. We can't boast like that. We, we can only say, with joy, by the way, everything I have is a gift. Everything I have is a gift. Psalm uh, 97 says that God is exalted far above all gods. Psalm 95 says he's the king over all gods. Um, yes, there is a divine arm wrestling match. And this is what I taught my boy early on. God can win all the arm wrestling matches. There's no tie. There's no stalemate. Mormonism teaches there's a, at least some strains of Mormonism teach that, there's a giant stalemate because all the exalted gods are, um, if you take, there's different Mormon views on this. Some say that all of them are equal in their knowledge and power. Others say that all the gods are still growing um, in knowledge and power at different stages of growth. The God of the Bible is the most high. He's the first and the last, incomparable, never learned, never received a gift. He's king above all others. He's exalted above all others. He shows off. He boasts. Christians clap their hands and they say, do it again, do it again. He, he, he defeats the gods of other nations. He... Um, he judges, in Psalm 82, he judges the other so-called gods, if you want to call them that, whether heavenly beings or earthly judges. Take your pick. He judges them. He's over them. He can make them die like men. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if, you've got some, if you want to proclaim something, <clears throat> if you want to declare something and herald something, do that. You can't go wrong with that. Uh, glory in the glory of God and make his name known. Um, the God of the Bible is worthy of worship. He owns the state you live in. He owns the valley or the, the region you live in. He, 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 uh, he owns every square inch. And evangelism is a ministry of reconciliation, but it's also uh, a process of conquest. Jesus is definit definitively one. He's been crowned as king. He has ascended on high. He has set at the right hand of the Father. It's all his. He's subjecting all things under himself. So evangelism is an act of conquest, not through violence, but through the preaching of the word, through the proclamation of the excellencies of Christ. So let, so let that be a theme of your heart. After Jesus resurrected from the dead, he gathered his disciples and said, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. In John, he tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit will help them remember what Jesus had said. Jesus says things like, my words are full of life and of the Spirit. And he says, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he treats the kingdom of God like, he depicts it like a farmer scattering seed. And he uh, describes the, the growth variance according to soils. And in the book of Acts, when this, the kingdom spreads, it's depicted as this, the word spread. The word was successful. The word had its sway. The word was received. The word was examined. If you're going to be a, a faithful disciple of Jesus, you've got to memorize the words 
and the works of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking here with primacy, I know all of the Bible is equally inspired by God, but I'm thinking here practically with primacy to the focus on the four Gospels. So a practical counsel I would give is to take one of the four Gospels, get an audio Bible that's really good, maybe in different translations, something that you can bear to, a voice and an accent you can bear to listen to over and over again. Get the Lumo Project, where they, they video all the scenes of the four Gospels. Uh, learn to use your commute well and devour the words of Jesus. What you want to be able to do is sit at, sit at a dinner table with your kids someday and share Jesus stories like it's normal. That's what Christians do. That's what missionaries do. That's what evangelists do. That's what husbands washing their wives with the water of the word do. They fill their homes with the words of Jesus. They fulfill the commission to teach others what Jesus has said. I get into conversations with, for example, Mormons here in Utah, and we'll talk about a topic, and I'll ask, what did Jesus say about that? And they'll you know, shoot off into some direction and talk about some idea or thoughts or modern teachings, and they'll say, no, what did G Jesus say about that? Maybe they'll summarize the ideas. No, what did he say? What did he say about that? What you want to do is be able to go back to the words of Jesus, and the stories of how Jesus exercises his authority. So uh, what's great about this is learning this doesn't box you into doing evangelism to a certain people group. It's equipping you to share the gospel where you're at and then where you can go. I've taken quite a bit of time in Utah to absorb the book of Matthew. And I've fallen in love with it. I love to share stories about the, the authority of Jesus demonstrated. So Jesus descends the mountain in Matthew 7. It says that, well, well by the way, Jesus had just talked about how um, those who hear and practice his words are like a man who builds his house on a good foundation. When he descends the mountain, uh, they say that Jesus is speaking as one who has authority, not as the scribes. And here's where we get Matthew 8 through 9, where it's just jam-packed with stories about how Jesus exercises his authority. And in Utah, um, arguably, what they call priesthood authority among Mormons is, is, in terms of focus, treated as more important than even the nature of God. So, I mean... The gospel is a declaration of the authority of Jesus Christ, and it dovetails with receiving grace. Jesus says, whoever hears my words and believes me, believes him who sent me, has eternal life. So I love to say things like, well, I'll just set this up a little bit. I like to ask, do you enjoy reading the New Testament? People say, yeah. What is your favorite of the four gospels? What are some stories from that book that have stuck with you, that have impacted you. And just as earlier, I, I would want them to introduce a topic to talk about and build on, now I'm wanting them to introduce words and works of Jesus that we can focus on. So I like to ask about the reading of the New Testament, the four Gospels, and the words of Jesus. Um, and when a topic comes up, I like to ask, well, what did Jesus say about that? And this totally requires homework on your part. You've got to get to know the four Gospels. What did, what did Jesus say about that? Well, do you remember when, dot, 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 and you open up your Bible, and you look at when Jesus addressed the topic? Or do you remember when Jesus did, and you open up your Bible, and you show something? So when it, when it comes to authority, I might I ask, um, how would you say... Jesus demonstrated his authority in the four Gospels. And we might tell the story of the centurion 
who sends for Jesus, and Jesus says he's, he, he will come and heal the, the, the sick servant of the centurion. And the centurion says, I'm not worthy to have you come inside my home to step in front through my front door. I'm a man of authority. I know how authority works. I can tell my subordinates, go, and they go. Do this, and they do it. Come here, and they come here. I know that, Jesus, you can just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus was astounded by the faith of the centurion. He hadn't seen such faith in, even in Israel. Well, right after that, you get stories, for example, of Jesus of being in a crowded house. <clears throat> in a crowded house, and two buddies take their, their friend up to the roof, and they lower him on a stretcher because he's lame, paralyzed. And Jesus, impressed by their faith, says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the riffraff in the back says, Who alone but God has the authority to forgive sins? Jesus knows, he says, I know what you're reasoning in your heart. What's, what's harder? What's easier to say to a man, your sins are forgiven, or to, to say to a man who's lame, get up and walk? And Jesus goes on to demonstrate his authority, showing that the Son of Man has authority to do both. And he just says, get up and walk. Now, um, one benefit of learning these stories, loving these stories, internalizing them, and then being able to share them is in evangelism, you want to be able to share things that engage someone or even involve them in a story. Stories are special. God meant for stories to be a vehicle of evangelism. And he's given us those stories in chunks in the, in the four Gospels. So you can... You can with a Utah, for example, you can have them finish the thought or fill in the story or sort of fill in details they know from the story. And then you can have them be involved in the conversation. Anyway, I'd love to just finish this out by going through stories like Jesus was in a boat and the disciples were afraid for their lives when the storm came. And Jesus just looks up at the storm and he says, be quiet. And all Jesus had to do was say the word. He, he, he crosses to the other side and he meets two men full of demons and they're terrified of him. Have you, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? And they ask to be injected into the pigs. And so Jesus says, go. They're terrified of him and they obey his word and they go and then they drown in the lake inside the pigs. Jesus meets Peter and he says, you shall be called Cephas. Who does that? Who just gives you a new name? when you, who, who, who decides what name you'll go by when you meet him? Who has the authority to, to name you by word of mouth? No legal paperwork, no judge order, no, no legal system required. Jesus just says it and it, it is so. He calls a tax collector from his booth and he follows. He calls men in a boat and they drop their nets. So you get to the end of Matthew and Jesus says, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations. He goes on to say, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Jesus verbally authorizes what he, what he commands. The authority to do what he says is embedded in the very words that he uses to command. If he says wait, you wait. If he says go, you go. If he says preach, you preach. If he says baptize, you are authorized to baptize. And that is a continuation of the theme of Matthew. Jesus might touch a leper to heal a man, but he doesn't need to. All he has to do is say the words. So by, by learning the Gospel of Matthew and knowing the stories and, and, and being able, this, by the way, this is a great reason to, as an evangelist to teach the third and fourth graders at your local church and Sunday school, because evangelism typically isn't profundity with uh, eloquent, sophisticated speech. 
it's talking to people who don't know much about Jesus. And so you learn with the third and fourth graders to, to communicate in love the truth of Jesus. And you could take that to the street and communicate it in an appropriate way to an adult. Well, having those stories on, uh, at hand to, to share is, is amazing. So I, I would encourage every person who's interested in doing evangelism to, and really every believer, to uh, love and absorb and gorge yourself on and become obsessed with, get, be in a season of obsession with one of the four Gospels and know it like the back of your hand, memorize the outline, know the words. Um, we're talking about Jesus here. He's compelling as a person. Uh, he, he wins people over through the sharing of his words and his works. He, that's what the Holy Spirit loves to use. Um, don't underestimate what's available to you in the four Gospels for meeting the needs of the people you're talking to. There's a lot more there, even in narrative fashion, available to you to use in evangelism than you realize. You don't need to restrict yourself to the um, equally authoritative and equally inspired short sayings of, say, Paul in a letter that are sort of pithy. Like the Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Beautiful, we love to share it. We love to show it. But complement that with with stuff from the four Gospels. The Gospel is that Jesus was the promised offspring in Genesis 3 that God said would crush Satan. Throughout the Old Testament, there was a question mark. Who will the offspring be? Who will be the one to crush Satan? Who will be the one to gather God's people effectively and permanently, setting up a kingdom that would not be shaken? Who would be the one to fulfill God's promises to David to be a king with an everlasting reign? Who would be the one to fulfill the promises to Abraham to bless the many nations? Who would ultimately fulfill, fulfill God's love for humanity, when God decided not to wipe out all of humanity, but preserve it through Noah? Who would be the one to forgive God's people? How would the Old Testament sacrificial system be fulfilled? Where would it find its fulfillment? Where would the temple find its fulfillment? Jesus is the answer to all that. He is the creator who became a baby. Born in humble circumstances, out of love for humanity, with an electing and effective love for his people, for the elect. Humble. <clears throat> powerful. Authoritative. Spoke Unlike any other man, I love the Gospel of John, some soldiers were sent to, temple police were sent to arrest Jesus, and Jesus just talked a certain way. And, and they came back and, and they were asked, why didn't you arrest him? He doesn't talk like anybody else talks. He tells the storm to shut up, and it sends shivers down the spines of his disciples. And they feared, who is this that commands the wind and the waves? He uh, is the, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. They attempt to humiliate Jesus and on Holy Week. His, his, um, his clout was powerful. At one point, people were afraid of his power. And so they, they attempted to cancel him. They attempted to humiliate him. And he had a power that I don't have in myself. He had a power to speak words of wisdom that shut his enemies down. And knowing he would be put to death, set his face toward Jerusalem, marched there like a boss, saying, no one takes my life from me. I give it up of my own accord. And he went to Jerusalem, 
praised by children. Hosanna, Hosanna. He stirred up the hornet's nest on purpose and was arrested as though a criminal, put through uh, unjust trials and ironically judged, ironically judged, Barabbas, criminal, released. Jesus, spotless Lamb of God, creator in the flesh, put to death as though an embarrassed, as though an embarrassing, humiliating, shameful criminal on a cross, pierced for our transgressions, absorbing the wrath of God, um, letting the, the attributes of justice and mercy kiss in the same moment. God satisfying his justice in punishing sin and then providing mercy uh, both as an offer and as an effective accomplishment. Jesus is buried in a tomb, which is guarded and sealed. He busts out like a boss. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God the Father did. Oh, and the Holy Spirit did. Oh, and Jesus also raised himself as a Trinitarian work of God, triumphant over the dead, over the death, the check is cleared, the payment for sin accomplished, Satan defeated, Jesus ascends on high, sits at the right hand of the Father, like a boss, and now he is in charge, he's king, he's king, he's boss. He's, he's, he's the, for Christians, he is our highest political authority. You don't want, let's say you don't want to, you do not want Donald Trump to be your highest political authority during this era, then you need a higher political authority than Trump. You don't like Obama, you don't like Biden. I, they're not my highest authorities. Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He reigns on high. He, he, uh, he has an ultimate sovereign will that can't be thwarted. He is subjecting all things under his feet. The Father will grant it all to him, and he will come back someday to judge the living and the dead. And we will either receive and welcome his return with joy, having been forgiven and reconciled and adopted and forgiven as a free gift by empty-handed, weak faith that is genuine and repentant receiving the immediate gift of being counted righteous in Christ, perfectly forgiven, permanently adopted, permanently. Or we will, at his return, wish we could die because it will be so terrible and frightening to behold the power and the wrath of the Lamb of God who will come back to crush his enemies and send them to hell forever. So, as a Christian, I have been forgiven. And as an ambassador, I want the whole world to know that Jesus is king. He is king over all cultural zeitgeists and woke sensibilities. He is king over all uh, religious hypocrisies, all corruption, all sexual immorality. He will render judgment. And he has a way of showing his glory through weak people. He has a, a way of calling to himself people that are not wise, they're not smart. They're, they're the ones who spread Facebook conspiracy theories. They're the ones who say cringeworthy things. They're, not, they're, they're disproportionately poor. They're disproportionately flyover country. They disproportionately have politics that the cultural elites don't like. They're disproportionately not what the world calls powerful or smart or honorable. And he saves and gathers a people for himself to show off his power and his glory and his mercy, his grace. And he has that people form into local churches with their own governances and their own um, unity and a faithful preaching of the word. 
And he blesses his people through that. And we're preparing, it's as though, the, the, it's as though we're a kind of little preview of the installed future government of the, of the world. The meek shall inherit the earth. Utah is mine. I am among God's people. The earth is mine. It's all mine. It'll be renewed and it'll be mine. And it, the, the, the local church is a kind of preview government, a little installment, an outpost of the kingdom of Jesus. He wins. So if you're going to follow a false religion that teaches that Jesus is not who I described him as, if you're going to worship a God who's not the first God, not the most high, he's a learner, he's a receiver of power from ancestor gods. If you're going to adopt a, a spirit of the age which contradicts the ethos and the commands and the words of Jesus, um, if you're going to rebel and be resistant, if you're going to hate that you're created and hate the design of the creator, you're going to push back against all that and you're going you're to reject the free offer of the forgiveness of sins through the ambassadors of Jesus, you're going to go to hell and you're going to be rightly punished for all your sins. But if you submit and you take a knee and you trust not in yourself, not in religion, not in falsehood, but if you trust in the true Jesus and you, you declare spiritual bankruptcy and you trust him for the forgiveness of your sins because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, you will be saved. So let's summarize it. Let's just say that was a lot of words, Aaron. You fleshed it out too much. I can't take it all right now. Well, here's the simplicity of it. In Romans 10, Paul says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. I got a comment on YouTube that I didn't let through. I didn't moderate it with approval. And it said, I'm so glad you know, that you're, you're there going against the Mormons. I grew up in Utah. They were really nice people. But if heaven was having to be neighbors with Mormons, I'd rather go to hell. And I, I was like, that's hateful. That's just so ugly and disgusting. Um, that's not how I feel. I want to go to heaven, and I want my Mormon neighbors to come with me. I want to sing with them. I want to pray with them. I want to worship the same God. I have the same essential foundation of the gospel. Uh, I want to ask them to pray for me when things come up. I want to be in the same local community, religious community as them. I want to go to heaven with them. I want to sing at the feet of Jesus. I want to say around the throne of God, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, and mean it together. Together. I love Utah. I love the Mormon people. It's weird when you meet people in Utah who want to get out as fast as they can. I hate it here, they say. Yes. Okay, well, I like it here. I'm going to seminary. I'm leaving the state for a while. I hope to come back, but I'm not running away from anything. I like Utah. I love Utah. I have affection for the Mormon people. I think they're pretty special. God made them. They're our neighbors. So I think, I, I wish, I hope that Mormons can see that we're their best friends. Um, there's so many people out there who are rightly uncovering the historical problems with Mormonism, the apologetic, sort of the scholarly uh, problems with the Book of Abraham, for example, with uh, archaeological issues. Christians did a lot of legwork, by the way, a lot of ground foundational pioneering work, like Sandra Tanner, sort of laid the foundation for many who came after her. But a lot of the people who are deconstructing Mormonism today, the John DeLins of the world, the uh, exmormon.org, I think, .com, I forget, it's uh, the community, the RFM community, Recovering from Mormonism community, a lot of angry, godless, hopeless, delusional atheists out there, cynics. They throw God out. They throw Jesus out. 
they, they, they blow at the wind of culture. They're happy to get on board with the, the zeitgeist or the ethos or the spirit of the age, whatever the progressive, liberal, popular thing is. That's their new religion. Christians, though, don't want to destroy everything and replace it with a hopeless, you know, the universe will come to an ultimate heat death. All thought and all life will come to an end, but it has a wonderful plan for your life. It's just like atheism is bleak. Uh, the Christians in Utah that are trying to reach the Mormon neighbors, we're trying to give them the gospel. We want them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want them to throw Jesus out we want them to know the Lord. So if you're going to have to experience the pain of having your false religion deconstructed, who better to receive the faithful wounds of a friend than from a Christian who wants you to join in the worship of Jesus Christ, who said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words won't pass away people of faith who are trusting in the person who is most worthy of our admiration, more reliable than any, you know, celebrity thinker or cultural figure who will outlast them all. What better way to have your religion deconstructed than to have it reconstructed with an aim toward trusting the words of the Bible, the person of Jesus, believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ?